we had a had to take Big Dog to Thailand years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, we did this great video of the robot walking in the sand, walking into the ocean mm -hmm. up to, I don't know, its belly or something like that. And then turning around and walking out all oh, while awesome. playing some cool beach music. Yeah. Great show. But then, you know, we didn't really clean the robot off and the salt water was really hard on it. So, uh, we, you know, we, we put it in a box, shipped it back. By the time it, it came back, we had some problems with, with corrosion. So it's the salt, it's the salt water. It's, it's not like- Salt stuff. <laughs> it's, it's not like sand getting into the components or something like this. Yeah. But I'm sure if if this is a big priority, you can make it like right. waterproof. Right, right. <laughs> that just wasn't our our goal at the time. Well, it's a personal goal of mine to walk along, <laughs> walk along the beach. But it's, it's a human problem too. You get sand everywhere. It's it's just a giant mess. Uh, so soft surfaces are okay. So I mean, can we just uh, linger on the the robotics challenge? There was a there's a pile of uh, like rubble they had to walk over. Is that's um, how difficult is that task? In the early days of developing Big Dog, the loose rock was the epitome of the hard walking surface because you step down and then the rock, and you had these little point feet on the robot and the rock can roll. Mm -hmm. And and you have to deal with that last minute, you know, change in your foot placement. Yes, yeah, so you, you step on a thing and that thing responds to you stepping on it. Yeah, and, and it moves where your point of support is. And so it's really, that that became kind of the essence of the test. And so that was the beginning of us starting to build rock piles in our parking lots. And, and we would actually build boxes full of rocks and bring them into the lab. Yeah. And then we would have the robots walking across these boxes of rocks because that became the essential test. So you mentioned Big Doc. Can, you, can we maybe take a stroll through the history of Boston Dynamics? Uh, so what... And who is Big Dog? By the way, is who? <laughs> do you try not to anthropomorphize the robots? Do you try not to? Do you try to remember that they're? This is like the division I have because for me it's impossible. For me, there's a magic to the to the being that is a robot. It is not human, but it is. It the the same magic uh, that a living being has when it moves about the world I, is there in the robot. So. Um, I don't know what question I'm asking, but uh, should I say what or who, I guess? Who is Big Dog? What is Big Dog? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll say to address the meta question, we don't try to draw hard lines around it being an it or a him or a her. Um, it's okay, right? People, I think part of the magic of these kinds of machines is by nature of their organic movement, of the of their dynamics, we tend to want to identify with them. We, we tend to look at them and, and sort of attribute maybe feeling to that because we've only seen things that move like this that were alive. And so um, this is an opportunity. It means that you could have a feelings for a machine. And you know, people have feelings for their cars. You know, they get attracted to them, attached to them. So that's inherently could be a good thing as long as we manage what that interaction is. So we don't put strong boundaries around this and ultimately think it's a benefit, but it's also can be um, a bit of a curse because I think people look at these machines and they attribute a level of intelligence that the machines don't have. Why? Because again, they've seen things move like this that were living beings, mm -hmm. which are intelligent. And so they want to attribute intelligence to the robots that isn't appropriate yet, even though they move like an intelligent being. But you try to acknowledge that the anthropomorphization is there and try to, first of all, acknowledge that it's there. And, and have that, a little fun with it. Have you know, our, our more, most recent video, it's just kind of fun, you know, mm -hmm. to, to, to look at the robot. We started off the, the video with Atlas um, kind of looking around for where the bag of tools was, because the guy up on the scaffolding says, send me some tools. And mm -hmm. Atlas has to kind of look around yeah. and see where they are. And there's a little personality there that is fun, it's entertaining, it makes our jobs interesting. And I think in the long run, can enhance interaction between humans and robots that in a way that isn't available to machines that don't move that way. This is something to me personally is very interesting. I've been um, 
I happen to have a lot of legged robots. <laughs> <laughs> I hope uh, to have a lot of spots in my possession. Um, I'm interested in celebrating robotics and celebrating companies. And I also don't want to, companies that do incredible stuff like Boston Dynamics. And I, there's, um, you know, I'm a little crazy. And you say so you don't want to, you, you want to align, you want to help the company. Because I, I ultimately want uh, a company like Boston Dynamics to succeed. And part of that we'll talk about, you know, success kind of requires making money. And so the kind of stuff I'm particularly interested in may not be the thing that makes money in the short term. I can make an argument that it will in the long term, but the kind of stuff I've been playing with is a robust way of uh, having the quadrupeds, the, the robot dogs, communicate in motion with their body movement. Hmm. The same kind of stuff you do with a, with a dog, yeah. but not, not hard-coded, uh, but in a robust way. Mm -hmm. And be able to c communicate excitement or fear, mm -hmm. uh, boredom, all these kinds of stuff. Uh, and I think, as a base layer of function of behavior to add on top of a robot. I think that's a really powerful way uh, to make the robot more usable for humans, for whatever application. I think it's gonna be really important. And um, it's a thing we're, we're beginning to pay attention to. Um, we really want to start, a differentiator for the company has always been, we really want the robot to work. We want it to be useful. Uh, Making it work at first meant the, the legged locomotion really works. It can really get around and it doesn't fall down. And um, But beyond that, it, now it needs to be a useful tool. And our customers are, for example, factory owners, people who are running a, a process manufacturing facility. And the robot needs to be able to get through this complex facility in a reliable way, you know, taking, taking measurements. We need for people who are operating those robots to understand what the robots are doing. If the robot gets into, needs help or, or you know, is in trouble or something, it needs to be able to communicate. And a physical indication of some sort uh, to, so that a person looks at the robot and goes, oh, I know what that's, that robot's doing. The robot's going to go take measurements of my uh, vacuum pump with its thermal camera. You know, you wanna be able to indicate that. And or even just uh, the robot's um, about to turn, you know, in front of you, and maybe indicate <laughs> that it's going to turn, and so you sort of see and can anticipate its motion. So these, this kind of communication is going to become more and more important. It wasn't sort of our starting point, um, you, you know, but now the the robots are really out in the world, and you know, we have about a thousand of them out with with customers right now. This layer of physical indication i think is going to become more and more important we'll talk about where it goes because there's a lot of interesting possibilities but if you can return back to the origins of boston and dynamics with so the, the more research the r d side before we talk about how to build robots at scale so big dog what, so um, who's big dog so the company started in 1992 and in um Probably uh, uh, 2003, I believe, is when we uh, took a contract from DARP. So basically 10 years, 11 years. Um, we weren't doing robotics. We did a little bit of robotics with Sony. Uh, they had a IBO, they had the, their IBO robot. We were developing some software for that that kind of got us a little bit involved with robotics again. Then there's this opportunity to do a DARPA contract where they wanted to build a robot dog. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we won a contract to, to build that. And so that was the genesis of Big Dog. And uh, it was a quadruped. And it was the first time we built a robot that had everything on board that you could actually take the robot out into the wild and operate it. So it had an onboard power plant, it had onboard computers, it had uh, hydraulic actuators that needed to be cooled. So we had cooling systems built in. Everything integrated into the robot and uh, that was a pretty rough start, right? It was, it was 10 years that we were not a robotics company, we were a simulation company, and then we had to build a robot in about a year. So that was a, a little bit of a rough transition. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, can, can you just comment on the, the roughness of that transition? Because uh, Big Dog, I mean, this is just big, 
uh, quadruped, four legs robot. We, we built a few different versions of them, but the first one, the er, the very earliest ones, you know, didn't work very well. <laughs> and we would take them out, and it was hard to get, you know, uh, you know, a go kart engine driving a hydraulic. Oh, is that what it was? <laughs> was and <laughs> and you know, uh, having that all work uh, while trying to get you know the robot to stabilize itself and so, so what was the power plant what was the engine it seemed like uh my vague recollection it, it <laughs> i don't know it, it felt very loud and aggressive and uh kind of thrown together is what it kind of oh it absolutely was right we, we weren't trying to design the best robot hardware at the time and uh, we wanted to buy an off the shelf engine and so many of the early versions of big dog had literally go-kart engines or something like that. Are Usually gas powered? like a yeah, gas powered two stroke engine. <laughs> and the reason why it was two stroke is two stroke okay. engines are lighter weight, but they're also, and we, we didn't generally didn't put mufflers on them because we're trying to save the weight and we didn't care about the noise. And so these things were horribly loud, um, but we're trying to manage weight because managing weight in a legged robot is always important because it has to carry everything. That said, that thing was big. Well, what I've seen the videos of. Yeah, I mean, the, the the early versions, you know, stood about, I don't know, belly high, chest high. Um, you know, they probably weighed maybe a couple of hundred pounds. But, you know, it, over the course of probably five years, uh, we were able to get that robot um, to really manage a remarkable level of rough terrain. So, you know, we started out with just walking on the flat and then we started walking on rocks and then inclines and then mud and then slippery mud. And, you know, by the end of that program, we were convinced that l legged locomotion in a robot could actually work because, you know, going into it, we didn't, we didn't know that. We had built quadrupeds at, at MIT, but they were, they used a giant hydraulic pump, you know, in the lab. They used a giant computer that was in the lab. They were always tethered to the lab. This was the first time something that was sort of self-contained, you know, um, walked around in the world um, and, and balanced. But, and, and the purpose was to prove to ourselves that the legged locomotion could really work. And so um, Big Dog really cut that open for us. And, and it was the beginning of what became a whole series of robots. So once, once we showed to DARPA that you could make a legged robot that could work, there was a period at DARPA where robotics got really hot and there was lots of different programs. And, um, you know, we were able to build other robots. We built other quadrupeds to hand, like LS3, designed to carry heavy loads. We built Cheetah, which was designed to explore what are the limits to how fast you can run. You know, we, we began to build sort of a portfolio of machines and software that let us build not just one robot, but a whole family of robots. To push the limits in all kinds of directions. And yeah, and to discover those principles. You know, you asked earlier about the art and science of legged locomotion. We it, were able to develop principles of legged locomotion so that we knew how to build a small legged robot or a big one. So the leg, leg length, you know, was now a parameter that we could play with. Payload was a parameter we could play with. So we built the LS3, which was an 800 pound robot designed to carry a 400 pound payload. And we, we learned the design rules, basically developed the design rules. How do you scale different robot systems to, you know, their terrain, to their walking speed, to their payload?